For more media content from Grace Community Church in San Antonio, Texas, go to gccsatx.com. Media used by permission of Heart Cry Missionary Society. Visit us online at heartcrymissionary.com. Let's open up our Bibles to Psalm 67. This will be much, hopefully, much more brief this evening. A radio interviewer this morning or this afternoon asked me, how do you get away with preaching so long? Um, so, uh, I want my boys to learn how to write like Scotsmen. Scotsmen are famous for being able to say the most amount of things in the sh- shortest smallest amount of words and uh, when my son Ian writes something I send it back to him and I say correct it make it more precise Um, I wish I could do that with my sermons but once a word is out of your mouth uh, it cannot be replayed it has been a joy for me to be here with you a great joy and to see the missionaries And all that God is doing through them and will do through them. And it's been a great joy to to watch this church minister and to care about God's mission. And and the men and women uh, whom God has called to be on the field. Please pray. Please give. It is worthy. It is worthy. Let's look at Psalm 67. Before I read, let me pray. Father, I pray that you that you would help your people, that you would get glory for yourself, that missions would somehow be promoted because Christ is exalted, that wrong perspectives might be corrected. That the eye of our heart might see clearly to lay aside that which is temporal and to look toward that which is eternal. Father, help us. And let it be known that we are helped. In Jesus' name, amen. Verse 1 of Psalm 67. God be gracious to us and bless us. Do you know what a phenomenal request that is? Do you know that it's, it's near blasphemy? It's near blasphemy. Now I want you to think for a moment about what the Bible teaches about man prior to coming to Christ. I want you to think for just a moment about what the Bible teaches about the radical depravity, the wickedness, the evil. Of men and what men deserve before God. Eternal condemnation. That even the angels, because they are just, would rightly applaud our destruction. Yes. So that now, I mean, think about this. That's what we were. But something marvelous, unspeakable has happened. Can you imagine the magnitude of what has happened to us in Christ Jesus? That those of us who were so wicked that heaven would applaud our destruction, we can now come before this same God and say, bless me. That's amazing. People sometimes ask me why I speak so much about man's sin. A reporter asked me that one time. He was furious. Why are you always talking about sin? And I said, because I want you to love God. He said, that doesn't have anything to do with it. I said, it has everything to do with it. Have you never read? She loved much. Because she's been forgiven much. How did she know she had been forgiven much? She knew much about her sin. Her appreciation was great. She knew from what the Lord had saved her. I want you to look at passages like this and just be utterly astounded at the magnitude of God's salvation in Christ. I want you to realize that for this to be true, Christ had to die in the most horrible 
and most unspeakable fashion under the greatest of curses. God be gracious to us and bless us. Now, look at the first word here. God be gracious. Do you see what the psalmist is recognizing? He's not asking anything based on his own virtue, on his own merit, on his own work. He's not standing up there and saying, God, give me what I deserve. Bless me because I'm worthy. That's the farthest thing from his mind. I remember one time I, um, uh, something of a move of God broke out in this church and, and people were in, in a church I was preaching in and people were kind of there in the aisles uh, laying down and praying and some people had come to the front and were praying and crying and I saw one boy that I, uh, he grabbed my attention so I went down beside him and I listened to him as he was praying and this is what he prayed. God, I just want you to give me what I deserve. And it's the only time I've ever stopped somebody from praying. I went like this on his shoulder. I said, stop it. Don't you ever, ever, ever ask God to give you what you deserve, young man. Because if he were to give you what you deserve, you would be in hell before the prayer got out of your mouth. The psalmist realized that, didn't he? Who am I, O Lord, that I should be numbered among your people? But also, I want you to realize something here, that although he knows he has no virtue or no merit in himself, still look at what he's doing. He's bold enough to go before the throne of God and say, be gracious to me and bless me. I know Christians who are well-meaning at times, but they have something of a false humility. They will say things like, I'm just not worthy to ask things. I'm just not worthy to go before Him in that way. I'm just not worthy that He should bless me. Well, we all know that. That's already a done deal. We agree with you completely. But you see, we do not go Before Him, because we believe ourselves to be good, we go before Him because we believe Him to be good. So to not go before God boldly is not saying anything about ourselves. It's saying a lot about Him. We do not believe Him. We go boldly. And He delights in people who go boldly. Who believe Him for what He has said. I'm going to take your word for it, God. You have said, come, I will come. You have said, open wide your mouth. I will open wide my mouth. You have said that you will fill it. I will expect to be filled. Bold praying. Not based upon virtue and merit of man, but virtue and merit of Christ. He says, God, be gracious to us. And bless us. Do you realize every time God blesses you, it's an act of grace? Every breath He gives you is an act of grace. Bless us. The psalmist is asking God to bless him. In his Hebrew mindset... And of course, being inspired by the Holy Spirit, being in agreement with everything the Bible teaches us, he is not here saying, Lord, bless me spiritually, as opposed to not being blessed materially. But he's not, neither is he saying, bless me materially, as opposed, as opposed to being blessed spiritually. He's saying, bless me in absolutely every thing that you have promised and can do for me, do it. Now that sounds selfish, doesn't it? Very selfish. That you, would you be bold enough to go before God and say, God, bless me in every way possible. Bless me spiritually. I want it all. 
prosper me. Lord, everything that you have for me, give it to me. I desire it. That's the way you should be. You say, but Brother Paul, that sounds so selfish. Yes, it does until you get to the next part. And cause his face to shine upon us that your way may be known on the earth. Now, I want to share with you a few things. First of all, a lesson I learned from from um, George Mueller many, many years ago. As I've said, he's been dead for a long time, but he's the, my number one, I guess, influence in my Christian life apart from the scriptures. And George Mueller gave his life to raise something above 10,000 orphans. Never asked for a dime, never raised funds, never made his needs known. When he died, he had nothing. But at the same time, you know what I learned from him? He said this. I never want anyone to see me haggard or worn or frustrated or frightened or nervous. Neither do I want anyone ever to see me in great need or with ragged clothing or with needs that have not been met. And this was his reason. Because they might think that my master is unkind. When we talk here about giving for missions and living for missions, when we speak about following Christ, please drain from your mind any Catholic idea of self-mutilation, any idea of causing yourself undue suffering for the sake of suffering. I want you to know that we have a great God who can bless us in so many ways. And we should always seek to ask from Him and to have everything that we need so that people will see our lives and say to themselves, what a master that person has. What a kind and generous King. So that's one side of the coin. Here's the next side of the coin. He says, God, be gracious to us and bless us. Verse two, that your way may be known on the earth, your salvation among all nations. Let the people praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. Now, up until now, the praying may sound somewhat selfish. Lord, bless me. Provide for my needs. Take care of me. So that people will know I have a kind master. But you need to understand something. The prosperity that the Lord gives us. Is for a greater purpose. It's that all may know him. He will be like a tree. Planted by rivers of water. That yields its fruit. In its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. Charismatic preachers use that a lot. There's only one thing they have failed to recognize. Trees don't eat their own fruit. The fruit that falls from a tree is for the hand, the mouth, and the stomach of another. We are to believe God and call forth. Lord, bless me that I may bless. That I may have to give. That I may be a channel of blessing to others. I want you to think about something for just a minute. In the time that we have. I want you to think simply. Of all the things laying around your house, all the toys never played with, all the clothing never worn, all the things that were purchased with great joy, and yet soon as you obtained them, you had no use for them. I want you to think about all the waste. Do you realize that if the American Christians simply eliminated their waste... Without sacrificing anything. 
how much they could bless the world and spread the gospel. I'm not speaking about living like some monk who deprives himself of everything. I'm speaking about a person who simply walks circumspectly. Who walks with wisdom. Who considers what the Lord has done for him and uses everything given wisely. Wisely. I've lived on both sides of this. As a missionary, I, uh, as a young single missionary, wear two, I had two pairs of blue jeans. They had more holes than jeans. I remember I married a couple there in Lima one time, and I actually had to wear a priest robe with some dress pants that were actually tied right here because the guy was so short that came out at the end of the robe so people actually thought I was dressed properly. And I thought it was wrong to have any sort of blessing, any sort of normal life. But in that I was wrong. But I don't think that's most American Christians' problem, is it? With what we throw away, with what we never use, we could send the gospel around the globe. You say, well, Brother Paul, that might have been true a few years ago. But Detroit's suffering. Did you ever think that it may be God's discipline to wean you away from materialism? Did you ever think it was because that which was given to you was not used properly? You say, well, what about everybody else? We shouldn't be concerned with everybody else, just us. I'll tell you something, America. You chose to serve the gods of gold and silver when the one true and living God was proclaimed to you day in and day out. God just might turn this nation over over to false gods who are cruel masters and you'll see what it's like to serve them. Be very careful. But at this moment, there's still grace. At this moment, we can still use what we have. You should literally go in and write out a list of the things that you can rid yourself of that you never even use. Get rid of it and use it for missions. Then look at the way you waste your time, the way you waste your money, the way you waste so many opportunities. Rid yourself of them. Your prayer, yes indeed, should be God be gracious to us and bless us. Why? So that we can bless others. One of the most terrifying things that I think about on the day of judgment is all that I could have done. And then to stand beside men and women that I know who have done so much more with the little they have had. Give you an example. Angel Comenares. He's a little Peruvian man about this tall. Bald headed, glasses, chubby little sort of fellow. Diabetes seems to be taking his life. I remember one time going up to go preach in a conference with him, and I brought a a movie maker, a filmmaker with me who was on his way actually to Brazil to be in the largest missionary conference ever organized in South America. And I said, before you go there, come with me to the northern mountains of Peru. I want to show you something. We arrive there, we're picked up. Angel says, Brother Paul, we're, we're getting ready to head up in the mountains to preach, but before we do, I need to I need to pick up a battery. And so we we go to the dump. And he's looking around, seeing if he can find a discarded battery that could be recharged for his microphone. Now, the filmmaker was kind of, I could see he was kind of put out. Here he was supposed to go to this big conference, and now he's walking around a dump with this little man looking for a battery he can use for his speakerphone for his for his microphone 
And I looked at him and I said, Brother, this little man is the father of 500 churches in northern Peru. God has used this little man to plant over 500 churches in northern Peru. Nothing. I think if we planted a church, we'd probably put it all over the internet, wouldn't we? We planted a church. There's a little man who can't even afford a battery. 500 of them. Oh, my dear friend, to whom much is given, much is required. To whom much is given, much is required. He's talking to you. Do you see that? Cry out for blessing, but then use the blessing. Take an archive of the blessings you have. If you are young, he has given that to you. Use your youth while you can. For days are coming when just to get out of bed will be difficult. If he has given you a mind, use that mind for him. If he has given you material prosperity, use it for him. And by the way, there is an old proverb that's true. You can't outgive God. If you have beauty, use it for him. Look at what is in your hand. Look at what he has given you and use it for him. So what is the reason for prosperity? That we might join in that great army of men and women who have laid down their life for the cause of the gospel. That we might go with them, that we might support them, that we might help them. That is the only reason you're sitting here right now with more wealth than 95% of the world. Say, Brother Paul, you don't know me. If you're living here right now, I can tell you, you have more wealth than 95% of the world. Why? Because we sing, my country, tis of thee? No. He raises up men and women and countries. And prospers them for only one reason. That they might proclaim the gospel. That they might use what they have for the sake of the gospel. We talked a little bit about prayer. We should have talked all week about prayer. But many of you sit there and go, I don't know. My prayers just don't seem to make it past the roof of my house. My prayers just don't seem to be answered. That's because you've got to realize something. Praying... Apart from the will of God is nonsensical. And you cannot pray according to the will of God until you've settled an issue. That you are seeking first the kingdom. And his righteousness. And that everything you pray, everything you ask for is in the context of. Of the advancement of his kingdom. Your attitude when you pray. Regardless of what you are praying for. Your attitude is this. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Let me share with you how it goes. Something like this. Let's say. That uh, you are sick. You are hurting. You have a malady in your body. How should you pray? This way. Father. Father. If by healing me, your name will be hallowed in a greater way and your kingdom will come in a greater way and your will will be done in a greater way, then heal me. But if even through my death, your name is more hallowed, your kingdom comes at a greater pace and your will is done more thoroughly, then grind me to powder. Lord, prosper me. That through the prosperity I receive, your kingdom will come and your will will be done. That I might have the grace to use what you have given me for the sake of the kingdom. But Lord, if you can get more glory out of my need and my poverty, then impoverish me. 
Because my only concern is not my well-being, but the advancement of the kingdom unto the glory of God. Until you've settled that issue, prayer is nonsensical. Do you understand that? Like Dr. Piper says, prayer is just a wartime walkie-talkie for those who are at war. When a man is on the front lines, when a woman is on the front lines, I always want to put that in there because we just forget that some of the greatest missionaries who have ever lived have been women. That's true. But when a man or, or a soldier is on the front lines... And he's, he's totally void. He, he needs reserves. He needs ammunition. He needs food. He needs all sorts of things. And he is on empty. So he gets on the walkie-talkie. I need reserves. I need food. I need ammunition. Where are you? I am on the front line. It causes an urgency for those things to be sent up. Now, if a soldier comes on and goes, I need ammunition. I need food. I need water. Where are you? Palm Springs. It's like, what? That's the way most American Christians are. I need food. I need water. I need this. I need that. Why? Well, because I've got a whole bunch of things I want to do. I've read the book, Get My Best Life Now, and I want it. If you're thinking I'm making fun of that book, I am. <laughs> I hate it. So what's wrong with Christianity. You ever seen lost people die? You ever seen children starve? You ever seen people gunned down in the middle of the street? I have. You ever seen so people so empty they couldn't breathe? How can the American dream compare to that? What do we care about reputation or fame? What do we care about soft clothes or kingly houses? What do we care? You see, and I'm, I'm going to end with this. It's all about passion. It's all about what you love. Let me give you an example. Sometimes people ask me a lot, a lot of questions about fasting. Brother Paul, you know, do, should I just pick a day and fast? What is fasting all about? And I tell them, I said, look, fasting more than anything, is a, it, it's a revelation of your heart. A, a, a revelation of what your passion is. Well, what do you mean? I said, well, let's say that uh, someone calls me up and they, a year early and they tell me, Brother Paul, I live out here in Canada, and I understand you like to hunt, and well, I'd just like to bring you out here to Alberta to hunt. Well, boy, I mean, that's a blessing to me. It would be a blessing to any hunter. Oh, that's, that's wonderful. So for an entire year, I'm thinking about, you know, I'm looking in the Cabela's magazines at all the things I really can't buy anyways. I'm thinking about the hunting trip and thinking about, oh, that'll be so beautiful to be out there in the wilderness and just driving my wife crazy, always talking about it and thinking about it. And, and the day comes and I've got all my bags packed and I'm getting in the truck and I'm going to drive there and, and I'm so excited and I'm just so thrilled. And my little boy, Evan, comes out and he says goodbye to me. And then right when he says goodbye, he steps back from the truck and he goes, Daddy, my head, my head, my head. And he falls to the ground. Now, at that moment, I don't go like this. I don't respond by saying, man, alive. Now I can't go on the trip. I mean, my trip is ruined. If I would do something like that, you would consider me a monster and rightly so. What has happened to me at that moment? At that moment, I have forgotten all about Canada. It wouldn't even enter into my mind 
because my passion is laying on the yard. And if you were to come up, if my wife were to come up to me and say, Paul, look, you've been planning this trip for a long time and you've been real excited about it. You go ahead and go and I'll take care of this. I would say, woman, what's wrong with you? Do you see every pleasure, every distraction in my mind has been evaporated in one moment because my passion lays here. You see that? That's that's fasting. Is when you sit there and and something happens, maybe a crisis in the church or a need or somebody struggling, someone about to go down. Or you hear that Christians are being killed in China or this or that. And it so strikes your heart that when someone says, here's food, I cannot eat. I can't even think about that. In a way, that's a great description of the passion for missions. Oh, have you seen all these new things that the world's offering? What? Get, get away from me. Look. There's Christian, Christians dying. There are places where the gospel isn't preached. Uh, there are children starving. Uh, leave me alone. Do you see? Now you say, well, Brother Paul, that... That teaching right there could cause a great extreme. Isn't it amazing that every time I point toward radical devotion to Christ, it's an extreme. And every time I tell people, well, you know, don't take this stuff too seriously. I'm, I'm okay. Isn't that amazing? What was it that the man told C.T. Studd, famous missionary, when he was, I believe, in Cambridge? An atheist walked up to C.T. Studd. Just, he said, if I believed that there was just one soul that was going to die and spend an eternity in hell, and I had the cure, I had the message, I would walk across England on my knees on broken glass to share the gospel with that person. All I want you to see tonight in this brief devotion is this. Well, let me put it this way. Today I was asked by a radio interviewer why, when I was in Peru, Christians seemed to be so much more serious about the things of God and devotion and missions so weaned away from materialism, what's the difference between those Peruvians and Americans? And I said, absolutely nothing. And he said, well, what do you mean? I said, when I first got to Peru, they were in a terrible civil war with the Sendero Luminoso, the Shining Path. It was known as the most dangerous, Maoist, militant group in the world. They were slaughtering people. 26,000 people died. Walk outside your house and be dead people laying, be woke up by bombs, windows getting blown out of the church, machine gun fire, dunking under pews. It was horrible. Sometimes have to wait two hours just to get a bag of rice. And when all that was going on, man, no one wanted to leave the church. All they wanted to do was talk about Christ. And all they wanted to do was talk about missions. And all they wanted to do was live their life for Him. But then, when the war was over, and prosperity started coming back into Peru, you started seeing the same malady set in in Peru that is so common here in the United States. My dear friend, hardship and persecution is never an enemy to piety. But prosperity is one of the most devastating things to true godliness. That is why it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. No one here has said, impoverish yourself. No one here has said anything of the sort. But what has been said here this week is, would you like to live? I mean, really live.
Would you like to become a part of something much bigger than yourself? Would you like to do something that had eternal value so that you look forward to your death in old age rather than doing everything in your power to avoid it because there's reward on the other side? Because there's a family on the other side? You may never go to Utah or Poland or England or Africa or Ukraine. You can impact that country, those countries. You can impact those countries. I pray that the Spirit of God would move in your hearts throughout the rest of your life. And gradually wean you away from all the things that sparkle but are of no eternal value. I pray that some of you would be raised up to go into the mission field. To go into the mission field. I pray that your children will be sent into the mission field along with mine. God has so much for you. So much. So much life. Remember what he said to Israel. But you would not. You would not. Don't let that be the case with you. Let's pray. Father I pray. That you would bless your people. With an eye that is light. That they would see things the way you see things. That they would be wise and judge what is proper. Lord, you desire to bless us and you. You're a good God and a faithful master. But teach us, Lord, also to be good stewards. To ask So that we might give. That it not be said about us that we rob our brothers by all that we own. Help us, Lord. In Jesus' name.